From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. In the pantheon of presidential debates, Tuesday night's event with President Trump and Joe Biden was, to say the least, memorable. It felt more like an angry reality television show and was far from informative for undecided voters looking for help in making up their minds. Today, we assembled a political roundtable to break down the debate. A note, this roundtable was recorded prior to the news that President Trump tested positive for COVID-19. I want to welcome Joe Fleming, 12 News political analyst, Stephanie Murray, author of Politico, Massachusetts, and of course, Ted Nisi, 12 News politics editor. And I hate to make all of you do this, but we're going to relive Tuesday night's presidential debate. Joe, I, I want to go around the Zoom, and I'm going to start with you on this fill-in-the-blank. Tuesday night's presidential debate was what? It was a train wreck, Tim, clear and simple. Steph? It was total chaos. And Ted? Hot mess. So none of you uh, use the word substantive, informative, um, well-moderated. I, I would know that we can get into that throughout this conversation. Joe, I'm sure your list is long. Um, what stood out to you most after watching that entire debate, if, if you made it through the whole thing? Oh, I made it through it. But I mean, what stood out was simply how bad it was, that it really wasn't a debate in the sense they were yelling at each other so much, led by Donald Trump. I think the average voter in this country got very turned off by that. I don't think anybody benefited from the debate Monday night. And I think a lot of the citizens of the United States are probably very upset with the tone that was set Monday night. How about you, Steph? I mean, what was your key takeaway uh, on, on this debate? Besides, I mean, look, it, it's easy to say chaos and, and, and all of that. Maybe that's your key takeaway. But what really stood out to you? I mean, this is a debate that was four years in the making. Basically, from the day that President Trump was elected, Democrats have been hungry to take him on on the debate stage and try to knock him out of office. Uh, a record number of people tuned in, and what we saw was basically the equivalent of when uh, your friends and family and people from high school are arguing in the comments of a Facebook post. It was just hard to uh, kind of discern any sort of message from the debate. It was confusing. They were talking over each other. Um, you know, it was really, I think, a shame uh, that this long-awaited debate was just such a, such a mess. And I, I'm just going to stick with you here, uh, Steph, w with that. You know, I, I like your point that this is a debate the Democrats have been waiting to have for four years. Um, you, do you think that maybe a lot of Democrats in particular came away disappointed that maybe Biden wasn't ready for how aggressive the president was in, in the debate? That's a great question. What I've seen uh, from, you know, people talking about this over the last couple of days is that the debate wasn't really prepared the right way, that the moderator wasn't uh, ready for what was about to happen, uh, and that it was kind of unpredictable. But on the other hand, you could kind of expect President Trump to interrupt and to kind of go off on his own on his own way, because that's just what he does. Um, what I'd like to see, I think that President Trump, you know, being the person to beat has let Biden not answer some questions about what he would do if he was actually elected and put in office, uh, which I think is kind of uh, a tough point for our democracy uh, that, you know, it's the whole message is beat Trump and there's not really as much about what will happen uh, if he beats Trump, what will happen after that. Ted, how about you? Um, top of your list on this one. I know we were texting that night, so I know some of your thoughts, but if you were to pick out one text, uh, what, what was number one? I think it's shifted a little for me, or at least I, I've got a second one, along with what uh, Steph and Joe were saying about the chaos of it and how I do, I do agree that I think a lot of voters were turned off. So many people have said to me they watched, you know, all of us, are, <laughs> we, we have to watch it for our jobs. People who didn't were turning it off after 15, 20, 25 minutes, they're saying. And, uh, but the other thing to me was actually that exchange on white supremacy, which, uh, you know, obviously was, was, was you know, jaw dropping in the moment. But, you know, just before we're taping this on Thursday, just before we came on the Zoom here, the White House press secretary again was struggling to give kind of a clear, forceful denunciation of white supremacy from the White House podium. John Roberts of Fox News went on the air a few minutes ago and just just erupted at people yelling at him for asking the question, saying it's an important question. Don't blame the media for this one. And, you know, along with just the fact of we're talking about white supremacy here and it, it it's shocking to a lot of people that it's so hard for the white house to distance itself from that you know every day that 
that the news cycle is dominated by a Donald Trump controversy is another day where Joe Biden has protected the lead he has in the polls, if the polls are correct. So it's both not the headlines the White House needed, it's now become a three-day story out of the debate. And, you know, when you're behind, you really need to shift the momentum. And with people already voting, they don't want to wait long to shift it, I would argue, if they want to, if the White House and the president want to come back. Joe, as Ted points out, a lot of people uh, watch just the first uh, 15 minutes. All four of us uh, are obligated to watch the, <laughs> the entire debate because of what we do for a living. But I wonder if for the, you know, whether it was a majority of people or half or whatever it is, the people that only caught the first 15 minutes, do you think there's a different perception uh, from those that actually sat around and watched the entire, almost the entire thing? Did the debate evolve or change over time? Well, I think the beginning of the debate, when they were talking about the Supreme Court, I thought Trump was rather good at that point. I thought he had Joe Biden on the defensive. He also talked about the fact that if the Democrats were in the same position, they would have actually done the same thing the Republicans are doing. He asked Joe Biden about stacking the court. Joe Biden did not answer that question. And I think there was a little issues. After that, I think the debate went right downhill. No question about that. I think early on, if you saw the beginning, it looked okay. But as you went on, it went downhill. Well, and Ted, um, before we uh, pull Steph back in here, Steph made you know the point she raised uh, the questions about how the debate was moderated. I think you and I uh, felt a little sympathy for Chris Wallace because you and I have both been on stage for some pretty raucous debates at times. So maybe that was more the crowd than the candidates themselves that you and I had to, had to deal with there. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you think at all the dynamic between Chris Wallace and the president had anything to do with how cantankerous it was? Because Chris Wallace has had some pretty tough interviews with President Trump on Fox News in the past. Yeah, I mean, I think President Trump has learned that he has, there's as much political upside for him uh, running against the media as there is running against the Democrats. He, he's constantly doing both. And I think he saw Chris Wallace as a, somebody he was perfectly happy to spar with, someone he does have a history of doing that with. Uh, you know, Wallace has said, you know, and as you say, I, I'm, I go back and forth between sympathy for Chris Wallace because I think any moderator, t uh, Tim Russ or whoever you want to name, Walter Cronkite, would have struggled to control President Trump with the strategy that he walked in on. But on the other hand, uh, Chris Wallace acknowledged to New York Times earlier in the week that he didn't expect it and didn't realize for a bit that what was going on. And as Steph said, you know, where, you know, you kind of say to someone, where have you been? Like, this is how the, pre the president is a steamroller. That's his political brand. That's how he gets through interviews. That's how. And so, uh, you know, to not expect that when he's fighting for his political life, I think was, uh, it's, and it's not just Chris Wallace, it's the team that was around him preparing him. You know, there should have been someone in the room with him saying, what if the president won't let anyone else get a word in edgewise starting with the third answer? And they, they didn't game it out. You know, as we uh, record this conversation, there are high level talks about how to change the format for the next two debates, for the next two presidential debates and CBS News. Nora O'Donnell reported yesterday, citing sources, that there is serious consideration to shut off the microphones. Uh, I don't know how all of you feel about that. I, I will just weigh in as someone who's moderated a lot of debates. I think that is a mistake. Um, it's not as if each candidate is in a soundproof room. Um, you're still going to hear the interruptions going on. The distraction's still going to be there for the moderator and for the candidates, particularly in the next town hall format, and potentially uh, the optics could be terrible and could backfire in the commission and the moderator, who I would assume would be the one shutting off uh, the microphone. What's the threshold? How is that call being, uh, being made? You know, frankly, I think the moderator must do their best to control the situation. And when it is out of their control, point out repeatedly that what that candidate is doing is against the rules of the debate and they're doing a disservice to the process and let the voters uh, make the call. Do you, any of you have an opinion on uh, what maybe the next debate should look like in terms of, of rules? Tim, I couldn't agree with you more that shutting off the microphones would be a pitfall for the commission organizing the debates and the moderator. Um, at the end of the debate this week, uh, a couple of Republican uh, state committee members here in Massachusetts tweeted that uh, the debate was really President Trump versus Chris Wallace and Biden was just there to witness it. So, so to everyone's point, I mean, running against the media and kind of the, the establishment, even as the president, uh, is the president's political brand and anything, you know, shutting off microphones or things like that, um, I think plays to his favor to his base in a way, because he can say that it's unfair. I agree. 
He's going to, he'll play it to his base. I think you really want to have the microphone, microphones on, especially this coming debate where it's going to be a town hall type setting. So I think you want a little bit of back and forth, not as much as we saw last Tuesday, but we do want some back and forth. Yeah, and by the way, if, if the debate caused, you know, as much as it wasn't the most edifying policy discussion, uh, you know, people, you know, had a takeaway about the president in particular and how he used that debate and what he thought the American people should experience that night. And if people like it, they can vote. I want more of this, four more years of this. If they don't think that's the right behavior for president, they can vote against him. You know, so that's the other thing. I think, you know, in the end, the, these are the two people nominated by tens of millions of our fellow Americans. And the, the media is not here to protect people who don't like it from those people. There need to be rules, but it's, there is a balancing act there. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to look ahead. Uh, Joe, you know, the poll show Biden is ahead, you know, national poll, poll, certainly not running away with it in the battleground states, up by single digits, depending on where you look. Um, so you could say that the president in those states is within striking distance. What does Trump need to do, or what I guess needs to happen to close that gap, do you think? I think Donald Trump needs to get the suburban voters back. I think he's lost a lot of those. I think his strongest message is the economy. I think he needs to say that simply, we had a great economy. It's gone down because of the virus. But if you give me four more years, we're going to bring this economy up better than it was when it was last March, that we could turn things around. But I need more time because of the virus. I think if he stresses that, he might close the gap in some of those swing states. Keep this in mind, though. In a lot of these swing states, Biden's had the lead for the last three or four months. Trump has not been able to close the gap at all, and there's less and less undecided voters there. Unless the polls are wrong, it's going to be very tough for Donald Trump in a couple of these states to close the gap, like Michigan and uh, Wisconsin. Steph, now that the primary is, I'm sure, for you, thankfully, in the rearview mirror, um, you've been focusing more on New Hampshire, um, which, you know, is, as we were talking about uh, before we started recording here, is our own little swing state in the region, uh, New England's own Ohio. Not a ton of electoral votes, but as you were saying ahead of time, it could be a tone setter. That's right. I mean, there are only four electoral votes up for grabs in New Hampshire, and so it's not uh, you know, the make or break state like a Florida or a Michigan or a Pennsylvania. But there are a few reasons why winning uh, New Hampshire is something that the Trump campaign wants to do. I mean, they've sent uh, members of the Trump family up there. Uh, President Trump has gone uh, there for a rally in the last couple of months. Um, Hillary Clinton won New Hampshire in 2016, but it was her smallest margin uh, of a state that she won across the entire country. So I think it was a point of pride for the Trump campaign to try to win it back uh, this time around. And don't forget that on the New Hampshire primary, Joe Biden left uh, before the results even came in because he did so poorly in the primary. Uh, he came in fifth place. So it's kind of incredible. I mean, I know a Democratic primary versus a general election is so different, but, you know, Biden to have this comfortable lead in New Hampshire, the last time he was in the state, uh, was a very different situation. When we come back, the mechanics of Election Day in a pandemic, an interview with Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Right now on WPRI.com, our newest 12 on 12 digital original called Atypical Election. We have a little more than a month to go until the November election, and this year voting is looking much different. The coronavirus has changed the way the election process is handled. For that project, which again you can see right now on WPRI.com, my colleague Anita Buffoni sat down with Secretary of State Nellie Gorbea. Here now is part of Anita's interview with Secretary Gorbea. So an election is a hurdle in its own right, sort of talk about, um, you know, you throw a pandemic in the mix, talk about how the state is sort of adjusting to our new normal in terms of elections. Yeah, no, you know, through this pandemic, uh, our eyes on the prize have been basically to make sure that all eligible Rhode Islanders can and do vote, uh, that you don't have to sacrifice your health for the constitutional right to vote. 
and for starting with our presidential preference primary in June 2nd, the September 8th primary, we, each one of those uh, election exercises, we've learned a lot about um, how to manage an election during a pandemic. And overall, it's been pretty good. So I'm feeling confident that come November 3rd, we will have shown the country uh, what an election can be like in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, simply put, what are the options that uh, voters have when it comes to voting in the election? I know there are three different uh, so, lay those out for So me. there's three options uh, for voting uh, in this election. But, you know, it's interesting because those three options have always been there. We always had mail ballots. We've always had some form of early voting through either an emergency mail ballot or something else. And then we've always had the election day. So these are not new, but we've really publicized them and tweaked them a little bit to make them easier during a pandemic. So you can vote from home uh, by requesting a mail ballot and every active Rhode Island voter at this point uh, should have gotten an application from our office uh, that basically all they have to do is to fill it out and sign it, send it back on the postage paid envelope that will then be reviewed by local board of elections, um, local boards of canvassers uh, in, in the city or town. And then once they approve it, then we send them a ballot. And the ballot gets voted at home and the comfort and safety of their home. From there, uh, they can either mail it back in a postage prepaid envelope that we include, or they can drop it into one of the 39 cities and towns drop boxes that the Board of Elections is installing uh, as we speak uh, throughout the state. Both are secure. Uh, I feel very comfortable that, that voting from home is very safe and that it will be, that your, your vote, if you're an eligible voter, will be counted. Uh, then we have uh, early in person, which is a new um, thing in terms of how it works. Uh, you are allowed to go to city or town hall uh, with your photo ID and you check in as you would in a polling location on election day. It's just that you're going to do it 20 days, uh, any of the 20 days before the election. So in this case, it's going to be from October 14th to November 2nd. And that's during business hours for that city or town hall. And then finally, we have November 3rd. Uh, then that will run as a regular election day. And what we're hoping is that enough people will have voted either from home or early that November 3rd won't be a problem from the point of view of getting large crowds of people, long lines, and creating the possibility of expanding, um, you know, the, the possibility of getting more COVID spread around. A lot of people are concerned about what polls will look like. So mm -hmm. sort of talk about how social distancing will be applied and mask wearing and all the requirements that will be need to be implemented. Uh, there's a lot of plexiglass involved. The Board of Elections has been installing uh, for uh, polling locations. You should check if you're going to go vote on November 3rd, please verify where that polling location is. A lot of the senior high rises, a lot of the senior centers are not available. So the cities or towns have had to figure out a different place. And you can find out uh, where your polling location is either by calling 211, which is the United Way's hotline, or you can uh, go to vote.ri.gov. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what you'll see is, you know, there will be poll workers that will be masked and uh, will have gloves and there'll be independent pens for every single voter that shows up that you can either take with you or you can deposit in a, in a collection bin at the outside um, at the end of the process. And, and you can um, just, you know, vote as you normally would. We do ask that voters that, that can please wear masks. There'll be a lot of hand sanitizer everywhere. And there's a new person in each polling location, a new job, which is the sanitizing person. So every time a voter goes and, and steps into one of the little booths to vote on, the tab on those tables, um, somebody will come in afterwards and basically spray the whole booth down. Mm -hmm. With concerns of cutbacks at post office uh, recently, you know, what are you doing to ensure that mail ballots mm -hmm. will get delivered and counted? So the minute I heard about problems with the U.S. Postal Service on the national news, my first call was for a local postmaster, who, by the way, we have a great relationship with, Jean Jackson. Um, and, and I asked her straight out, are there any mailboxes being removed? Are there any equipment? And she said, no. And I don't have any doubt that we can deliver the mail just as we have in every election cycle. We didn't just discover this, we, we actually have had a long-standing relationship with our local post office here in Providence. Mm -hmm. 
You know, as you mentioned, the mail ballot applications, we've been hearing a lot of people who have gotten applications for somebody who died or doesn't live there. Sort of talk about, you know, is it legal for somebody to, uh, you know, uh, send it back on behalf of somebody else? Sort of talk about that yeah, process. If, if people receive uh, a mail ballot application for a person who no longer lives at that house or apartment, they are instructed, and the envelope has very clear instructions this time around, to please send it return to sender so that we can then mark that person as an inactive voter and start the process of removing the voter from the list. What it really means is that nobody ever told us at the Department of State that we needed to remove the voter. So be you know, a good citizen and help us do that. Uh, what you cannot do, absolutely cannot do, is open the mail because you are not, it's, it's, a, it's a felony to open somebody else's mail, or to somehow destroy it and, and not get it back to us. You know, it's opened, it's opened up a lot of uh, people who are skeptical of the process. Yeah. Uh, you know, they think that it opens the system up to fraud. What would you say to those people? Uh, I would say call us. We'll walk you through your fears because we have taken precautions at every step of the way. There are a ton of people involved in running this election from all political persuasions. And so you can trust the integrity of elections in Rhode Island. I can't speak to what happens in other states, but I can tell you that as Rhode Islanders, we have a lot of good procedures in place. And Rhode Islanders can be proud of the fact that we have invested both in, in protecting our systems from cyber uh, attacks. Uh, we've, we've taken measures to make it easier for people to vote during this pandemic without risking the integrity of the election. How do you police? Uh, mm -hmm. How do you police if somebody was voting uh, with the mail ballot as somebody else, and then going to the polls and voting as themselves? So, so the, the central voter registration database actually will mark uh, when um, you, Anita, will have received a mail ballot. If you then try to vote on election day, you won't be able to. The poll worker will see that you were sent a mail ballot, whether or not you cast it, and will say you can't uh, vote today at the, at, the, at the ballot box, what you can do is fill out a provisional ballot. Mm -hmm. And that ballot will be reviewed later by the Board of Elections to make sure that there's no other ballot under your name that has already been uh, voted. So, so how will, when will we know the results? It'll probably take a few days. It's, we're not gonna have the results on election night because we're going from a, a system where we had people mostly voting on election day to one where a lot of mail ballots are gonna be received. We've already received 75,000 mail ballot requests mm -hmm. uh, here for this election. So there's nothing nefarious going on, just it's an open process. If you're really interested, you can actually go down to the Board of Elections and watch them as they process the mail ballots mm -hmm. and see that this is, this is all fine. It's just a lot of mail to go through. To some who, don't, who aren't familiar with the process, what's how do you handle elections compared to the Board of Elections? So there are three entities in Rhode Island that manage uh, elections. You have my office, I'm the chief state election official, and I run the uh, statewide central voter registration database, the voter lists. I also prepare the ballots, and once the ballots go to the printer, then those ballots um, are, are handled by the Board of Elections. So, I can send out the mail ballots, but the mail ballots are received over at the Board of Elections. And then they take uh, care of the counting and making sure that there wasn't anything that happened. Recounts, things like that. By the way, uh, we will also have a post-election audit, uh, which will be the first time that we do that for a general election. Mm -hmm. And that's handled also by the Board of Elections. The local boards of canvassers are also very important. They're local election officials and they make sure that the polling locations have been selected, that um, the poll workers are, are hired and trained with the Board of Elections as well. Uh, so it's really a team effort. Elections are team efforts. U.S. intelligence officials are saying that Russia continues to try to meddle in our elections. Um, is the possibility of a Russian threat um, on your radar? And if so, what are you doing to make sure that our elections are protected in Rhode Island? Uh, yes, in addition to a pandemic, we absolutely are taking care to make sure that any foreign actor has a really hard time trying to get into our systems uh, and that we have uh, mitigations in place. Like, so what happens if they do uh, mess with, with our, for example, our poll books? Uh, we would have, we've already planned out 
for uh, alternative procedures to run the election. And that's the biggest security that we can have. It's not preventing the attack, as you know, in these, this day and age when humongous global multinationals are being hacked. Uh, the, you know, we might not be able to with, you know, prevent a hack, but we have taken precautions in terms of paper uh, copies and, and software copies and you know, all sorts of security that we can't get into. Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we, we defend ourselves mm -hmm. and protect the election. Uh, we also are scouring uh, the social media uh, that happens here in Rhode Island to make sure that misinformation is not being propagated by bots and foreign actors, which is another really big concern. And we've partnered with the federal government on this. The, set, um, the Department of Homeland Security's um, Center for Internet, uh, no, Cyber Internet Security Agency, it's a new, a new title for that agency, CISA, as we call it. Uh, we're part, we've got sen new sensors that, it, that look at all the internet traffic. Uh, we've done a lot to really strengthen the security of our elections on, on the cyber front. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.